Good afternoon, everyone. I think we still have maybe a couple people coming on in, but um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm so delighted that you're here for the Citrus Research Exchange. My name is Camille Crittenden. I'm the Executive Director of Citrus and the Bonato Institute. Uh, we have the research exchange, as you might know, every Wednesday at noon-ish uh, for an hour, and we really welcome you here in person, and we welcome all those who are visiting with us online as well. The talk will be archived and made available later as well. We're doubly privileged um, this afternoon to have not only our esteemed um, speaker, keynote speaker, but also uh, one of her colleagues to tell us a little bit more about the organization that she um, leads and, and works with here um, on campus and at LBNL. So I'm really delighted to introduce our speakers today and as I said doubly excited that we'll have um, first a few remarks from Dr. Bethany Goldblum um, who is the NSSC Nuclear Science and Security Consortium Executive Director. So she will um, make a few remarks and tell us more about that program before introducing Dr. Jana Feldman who's a non-proliferation and international safeguards analyst at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Um, Dr. Feldman has uh, supported the National Nuclear Security Administration and other sponsors in assessing international nuclear security problems, formulating policy options, and implementing non-proliferation non initiatives. Um, she's had a, a long career that includes an undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley, so we're very happy to have her back. <laughs> so I'll welcome um, Dr. Goldblum to the stage, and then she'll um, introduce our, our speaker. Thank you. Hi. Well, first I just want to thank Citrus for the opportunity to co-sponsor this talk today. So the Nuclear Science and Security Consortium was originally established in 2011 um, by the National Nuclear Security Administration with the goal of training the next generation of nuclear security experts. And we're composed of seven universities and five national laboratories. Um, you can see them listed on the map here on the slide with UC Berkeley as the lead institution. So our goal is to train the next generation of nuclear security professionals, and we do that by engaging in research and development in collaboration with the national labs. So each of our students have a national lab mentor as well as an academic advisor, and um, they perform research in a wide range of areas. We have fellowship programs that support these students in the research activities. So this is a chart that shows our primary research focus areas and then our four cross-cutting areas. So the research focus areas are organized around fundamental disciplines, nuclear physics, radiochemistry, nuclear engineering, radiation detection, and nuclear instrumentation. And then the different research activities have elements addressing um, topics within nuclear data, modeling and simulation, nuclear security policy, and this is all um, underlined um, through a foundation of education activities. So in addition to the fellowships that we support, we have a number of um, opportunities on the UC Berkeley campus that are available more broadly that we want to make you aware of. So the webinar series of which this is a part that we're um, sponsoring with Citrus, where we bring speakers in mostly from the National Lab subject matter experts um, about once a month um, to campus to talk about their research activities. We also sponsor a number of summer programs, the NSSC Los Alamos Keepin Nonproliferation Science Summer Program, a nuclear policy boot camp at George Washington University, um, a nuclear analytical techniques summer program at UC Davis. And these are all available to students from outside the consortium as well. So if you're interested in these, you can visit our website and apply. And there's um, funding support available for your participation as well. We've also sponsored a number of courses on campus. I've highlighted two here. There's the nuclear security course, the nexus between policy and technology. And this is um, co-offered between the Goldman School of Public Policy and the Nuclear Engineering Department. 
And then more recently, we introduced a hands-on introduction to radiation detection, which is a freshman level course where students can build their own Geiger counter and then use it to look at different applications of radiation in the real world. And then coming up in just um, a, about a week or so, we're going to be hosting um, an event in collaboration with the Project on Nuclear Gaming, the largest online wargaming event ever for academic purposes. And that'll be um, November 12th at 3 p.m., um, also available online. And so if you're interested in any of these activities, you can visit our website. Um, you can contact us via email. Um, check us out on Twitter to learn more. And again, I want to thank Citrus for the opportunity to be here to partner with you all today. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jana Feldman to the stage. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bethany. Thank you, Camille, for having me, um, to Citrus for having me. And thank you all for coming. Um, does anyone need a few more seconds with the slides for contact info? OK. Um, so as Camille said, I am a nonproliferation and international security analyst at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, I, uh, I am by profession a nonproliferation analyst. Um, I previously worked at the International Atomic Energy Agency as, as an open source analyst, and this informs some of the work um, that I'm going to be discussing here today. By way of introduction into this talk, let me ask those of you in the audience, um, are there any nuclear engineers besides Dr. Goldblum? <laughs> okay, are there any other kind of um, people who worked on the technical side of the nuclear fuel cycles, so radiochemists? Or, or anyone else, okay? There are a couple of hands. Are there machine learning specialists? Are there um, policy analysts, non-proliferation analysts, or international security analysts? Okay, so there, there are a few. Um, it makes sense that all of you are here because this is uh, quite an interdisciplinary project. I think it was very thoughtful on part of uh, Citrus to put these two talks together, the N NSSC introduction and this talk, because again, this is the area that brings together people from very different backgrounds. Um, you see my name up there, but I represent a team of maybe about two dozen or three dozen people at Lawrence uh, Livermore National Laboratory, people who are analysts, who are nuclear fuel cycle experts, who are machine learning specialists, high performance computing uh, specialists. Um, and the goal of this project was to build a um, multimodal deep learning system to help analysts um, look for indicators of uh, proliferation activities in open source data. Let me tell you why this is, um, why this is a challenge. Um, and it is a challenge, um, even though we've been, we've been, and by we I mean uh, governments around the world, the International Atomic Energy Agency, people in the non-governmental organizations, students, so the community, have been sort of monitoring proliferation activities or states' activities to develop nuclear weapon programs clandestinely for a long time. The IAEA has been doing it for, you know, since the late 1990s. Um, but the work that they've been doing was primarily text-based. So we were, we're using information that is in text form. Um, and as a, the, in a roundabout way, what I'd like to um, make the case for is uh, there's a lot more or there's a lot of wealth in visual information that we can't get at in a systematic way. And this is why this project is, is important to me as an analyst. Um, an image is worth a thousand words. What you see here is, is an image um, from a North Korean newspaper of a visit by the current North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, to a tractor factory. The write-up of this visit is very bland. Um, it's, it, it's just an article that says, you know, he visited this tractor plant, he was shown some equipment, he was happy, he talked to workers, etc. There are accompanying images, and what you see um, in the images is pictures of equipment. In this particular case, this is a picture of what looks like a flow-forming machine, and that's a type of equipment that could be used in a gas centrifuge enrichment program. Um, gas centrifuge enrichment is a, a, a nuclear fuel cycle step that you need to get from natural uranium uh, to an enriched, highly enriched uranium 
form. Um, so the text description of that misses this detail. The image has a lot of really useful leads for analysts to follow on. You can see, um, if you can uh, zoom in on a label, in this particular case, that's not really uh, a useful label, but in theory, you could zoom in on a label and maybe see who the manufacturer of the machine was. That gives you a sense of whether they have indigenous capabilities or whether they, they procured it uh, from abroad. You can look at the size of the machine and that can tell you um, how large their program is, perhaps, the capabilities. If you look at the ceiling, there are curved features of that ceiling that can give you ideas of, um, at the, to the location of, uh, potentially location of that factory, so that can guide your searching through satellite imagery, for, exa for example, or overhead imagery. Um, and then you can look at people, and if you're familiar with who these people are, uh, what ministries perhaps uh, they represent, that also gives you a broader background as to um, the importance of this visit and just, and just put this, puts this in, in context. Getting the, these images systematically is, is very hard. Um, videos, getting videos is uh, even harder. So finding relevant videos and then finding relevant content in those videos is hard for a number of reasons. I have a count going of how, how many new video hours of video is uploaded in, in a given 10 seconds. This is now way out of date, um, but the point here is that there is, there's just so much information that is becoming available in open sources, so available to be found, to be analyzed, but it's just, it's just too hard for a human analyst uh, to do it. So how does the analyst do this now? Um, if you can see up there in the search box, the way the analyst would do it is they would go to a uh, database or a search engine. In this case, this would be um, uh, YouTube, Google's video uh, engine. They would type in some uh, keywords, so spent fuel reprocessing, uh, that's another important fuel cycle step from which you would get plutonium, another way to get a nuclear weapon. Um, so it could be a simple search string, it could be a more complex search string, or a really, really complex search string. The search strings depend on the search engine that the analyst uses. Um, so this is particular to one, and they would have to recreate a search string for, for a different um, uh, search engines. And then they would start reviewing. In this case, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there are over 6,000 results. Um, and the analysts would just sit and they would browse. They would look at the titles. They would look at maybe that brief description that there. They might look at the um, thumbnail to see if it's something that's worth clicking on. Um, but it's, it's too much. So they would do this until they get fatigued. And they are just hoping that the search engine's algorithms puts the most relevant search results to this query up front so they don't have to go too far down in the details. So let me give you, uh, let me give you a more specific um, example of why this is challenging and why we need um, um, a system like the one we have designed. Um, we are interested, let's say an analyst is interested in looking at videos of research reactors. So they, what they would do is they would go, as I demonstrated in the previous example, they would type in research reactor and they would get their results. Excuse me. So here they get this video. Um, you see the title of the video. What you see on the left is a little bit of a description of that video. And what you see on the right are keywords that are embedded in um, the search engine's algorithms. And you can see that in the title, there's a word reactor. Among the keywords, there's the term research reactor. And in the description, there's a, a term research reactor. So this is really useful. This is a really well annotated video, um, which is great. Um, consider a different example. You have a video, so I'm still interested in research reactors. Um, consider this video, which was not returned as part of my research reactor search. Um, we found this video by searching for uh, trafficking of uranium in French. That's the search term that you see. You see the snapshot, the thumbnail, you see the description, the title. Uh, so here's the description and here are the keywords. So just by quickly looking at it, you can, you can see that there is no um, 
there's certainly no research reactor in the keywords, among the keywords. There's not even a word reactor in there. And um, trust me when I say that there isn't in the description of the video. What we find, however, if you watch this video, is there is certainly um, footage of a research reactor. You know, you get, you get a, a video of the internals of the spent fuel pond um, or of the fuel pond. You see actual fuel rods. You'll see someone holding an actual fuel rod. In the background, you see that round thing. That's a diagram of the core that tells you where the fuel rods are, are located. So there's certainly relevant content for what I'm interested in, but I wouldn't have gotten that video by a traditional way of searching, which is a text-based way of go searching for the words research reactor in the metadata of the video. So clearly, um, the way we're working now, the way analysts are looking for information now, um, they are missing relevant content for their work. So let me sum up these, um, these challenges. The, the volume, the rate, the diversity of uh, information, open source visual information in particular, is um, outpacing and overwhelming the human analyst's ability to cope. Um, what this means is we're leaving, the analysts are leaving relevant information unprocessed, unanalyzed. Um, what we're looking for is, uh, it's very obscure, it's very unique, there are not a lot of, there's, there is a lot of nuclear relevant data out there, but relative to everything else, it's, it's a needle in a, in a haystack. A lot of this data is unlabeled or it is improperly, improperly labeled. Um, there are a lot of sources, so YouTube is great. It probably indexes the most of any search engine or database out there of relevant content, but it is by no means comprehensive. And so there's a lot more sources out there that we're simply not getting because we, we can't go to those sources and, and search. And a lot of the data is unstructured. It doesn't come in the same format, and so it doesn't lend itself to kind of traditional ways of working with, with data. So we decided, we at the lab decided to try to take advantage of some of the machine learning um, research that's taking pl place at the lab, um, along with some of the advances in high performance computing for training of some of these uh, neural nets, and apply it to the nonproliferation um, area. So, what we're interested in is answering this question of uh, where is, what is the state of development for a particular country in a particular uh, nuclear fuel cycle step or in their whole program? How close are they uh, to? Uh, clandestinely building a weapon, not whether they're going to do it, so we're not looking at intent, we're looking at their technical capability uh, to do so. So we're, we're interested in designing, um, designing a system uh, that essentially has a, an, um, a process in mind, so in our case it's a, a nuclear fuel cycle process, so going from uranium ore to a nuclear weapon, and we'd like to take all the open source data that's, that's available to us and overlay it on top of that process. And then given certain seeds, so we've trained the system, bring back information that is similar to those seeds. And I'll talk more about the process model and what those uh, seeds are. So the process model, for those of you who work with the nuclear fuel cycle, um, this is familiar. It's called the nuclear fuel cycle process model. In our case, it's not cyclical. We laid it out flat. But essentially, it's all the technical steps that one would need to go from uh, the um, source material, so uranium ore from the ground, into a nuclear weapon. Uh, you can get nuclear weapon by two ways. You can get it, uh, you can either have a highly uh, enriched uranium uh, fueled weapon or a plutonium fueled weapon um, and you see those in red and in blue in the first layer you have kind of your traditional nuclear fuel cycle steps um, so you'll go from mining uranium milling it and then you convert it into a form that's uh, suitable for um, enrichment or for converting to fuel if you want uh, a uranium weapon then you will need to enrich it um, and you can enrich it using 
several different ways, and that's what you see in green, kind of a second uh, layer to our process model. You can enrich it using a gas centrifuge enrichment method or gaseous diffusion or laser isotope separation, etc. Um, if you want a plutonium weapon, you, you fabricate your fuel and then you run it and you radiate it through a reactor, you get your spent fuel, you reprocess it and you extract plutonium. So our third layer in what you see in yellow are different types of reactors and research reactors. Um, what we wanted to do is then take that model, um, we needed to train our system, so we needed our, systems to, to, our system to understand um, everything about this process. Um, so what we've done is we populated each node of that process model with relevant data of different modalities. What I mean by modalities is we worked with three in our case. We worked with text, we worked with images, and then we worked with videos. Our um, goal was to populate each node with each of the three modalities. We succeeded to varying uh, degrees with populating every single box of that process model, mainly because um, there's not a lot of open source uh, visual data available about every um, step of the fuel cycle, about every piece of technology, about every uh, step of the process um, for, for everything, both for reasons of uh, it's sort of strategically significant technology, so you don't want pictures of it out there because it might reveal something to your potential proliferator, and states that um, work in this area, in the area of enrichment, for example, this is commercial secrets for them. They don't want information about the sizes of their gas centrifuges uh, released because it might give competitors uh, advantages. So we collected as much as we could um, and we covered uh, to some degree the whole, uh, the whole fuel cycle. But as I'll talk about future next steps, this is an area where, that we are interested in um, exploring more about. So our framework for multimodal feature learning, um, and let me take a pause here and say um, our very large team, as I said, was composed of analysts and machine learning specialists and uh, high performance computing specialists and nuclear fuel cycle experts. I'm a non-proliferation analyst by training. Uh, it's been wonderful to learn about machine learning, but I am by no means an expert. So I will hopefully do justice to my colleagues in representing their machine learning approach. And I'm happy to answer any questions to the best of my abilities. And if I can't, I will take them home and write back to you. Um, so with that, uh, let me give you a very short, under the hood uh, intro into what we actually build. Um, so this, this, the framework that we built for this multimodal feature learning, meaning text and images and videos, uh, is what we call the semantic wheel. And it's based on uh, two main steps. One is learning unimodal feature representations, so training the system, training the individual uh, neural nets, so text neural nets and image neural nets and then video neural nets, and then learning the joint feature space uh, mapping. So the goal is to learn the mappings from the raw unimodal data to a feature space where um, conceptually similar data will be proximal. So things that are about, let's say, um, uh, a scientific article, a text that's about uranium mining, the vector about that text will be mapped to a certain space in a combined um, feature space, and it will be near a vector of a video about uranium mining because they're conceptually similar. So we train them individually, the neural nets first, and then we combine them. Um, we found, uh, and so, so then the retrieval um, of what we're interested in is uh, returning nearest neighbors to our seed query. And this is where some of our training data came in useful. So we found that training these unimodal DNNs um, first uh, then requires the system to have far fewer subject-specific uh, training um, pairs, text and image, image video, text video, and so on. So this is uh, um, the, 
benefit that we foresee of this is that this will allow a much quicker integration of new type of data beyond text, beyond images, beyond video. Here's a, another way of looking at this uh, semantic wheel and multimodal feature space. Uh, so uh, we, we train our individual uh, modality DNNs, so the text DNN, the terms, the text terms, the image DNNs and video DNNs, DNN is a deep neural net. Um, we train them using both unsupervised and supervised uh, techniques on a large scale generic open source data sets. So what you are probably typically familiar with is cats and cars and airplanes, things like that. And then we fine tuned it with a very small curated non-proliferation specific data set. Let me give you a sense of the numbers. The um, Caltech has a, there's a Caltech UCSD birds data set, cub data set that is frequently used in machine learning. Um, it has photos of 200 bird species with 11,000 images. That is considered a small data set. In our case, our nuclear fuel cycle specific data set had about 700 images in 15 categories, so dramatically, dramatically smaller. Um, so this, this approach, um, we, we found success with this approach of training individual uh, deep neural nets and then combining them, which did not require us to have a large subject specific um, nuclear fuel cycle uh, data set. Let me give you um, some unimodal and bimodal, um, bimodal retrieval results. Um, so this is a, an example of a unimodal uh, um, result. So within modality, in this case it's image to image. What we, what we did he here is we took 54 nuclear fuel cycle specific um, images, and we embedded them in a data set of 50,000 images from ESP games data set, for those of you who are familiar with, um, with uh, machine learning. Um, and what you see up there is out of the top 20, so the seed image is in green. Um, you probably can't see it. It's, a, it's an image of a hot cell, which is a piece of equipment that's necessary for uh, spent fuel reprocessing to, to get plutonium. Um, and what you see, if you can see it, um, out of the top 23 results, there are 19 true hits. So we, we out of our first kind of Google page, uh, we get very relevant results. Um, there are a couple of uh, not relevant but visually similar um, results as well. We used uh, standard retrieval uh, metrics such as average precision and mean average precision, um, and you can see those in the table um, on your on your right. The rows represent different nuclear fuel cycle categories of image data that we had. So uh, I'll just read some of you some of them off for you. Centrifuges, so images of centrifuges, centrifuge cascades, um, cooling ponds for reactors. Uh, we have hot cells, we have different types of fuel elements for different types of reactors, um, we have schematics as well, uh, cylinders for holding uranium hexafluoride, this material, and the column in the middle is average precision when we used only one seed image, and the column on the, on the right is um, average pre precision when we used five seed images, and the, you, you probably can't see the numbers very well, but our, um, what the numbers demonstrate to us is the more seed images uh, you use, the better, the better your results, um, obviously. Here's another, it's one of our favorite examples, uh, also image to image, but in this case, for our seed images, um, we gave the system stock images, so images, and these are images of flow forming machines. If you recall the picture from the very beginning about a uh, North Korean leader uh, visiting a tractor factory, that's, that's the equipment. And these are brochures, they're stock pictures from manufacturers of these machines, so they're very clean images. Uh, they're most likely n not gonna be a lot of clutter around those images. Um, 
they're not perhaps what you are going to find out in the wild. Um, but what we found is that our system actually did retrieve three out of five images that we hid in our data set. So three out of five were retrieved in the top 23 results. And it is really impressive because we're giving it pictures of things that you can fairly easily find off the manufacturer's websites or brochures. And we're asking your system to find um, live, dirty, raw images um, that are similar to that. And it is finding, it is finding them. Uh, they're from different angles. They have a lot more pe people in there. The, the uh, lighting is not so good, but it did successfully find them. So this, from the analyst point of view, this is pretty amazing. Let's move towards um, bimodal retrieval results. So we're starting with um, text, text to image. So what we did here is we went into our system and we typed in a search um, and we asked the system to find us images that are semantically similar to what we searched for. So in the top example, uh, it's centrifuge cascades. And as you can see, um, if you can see, among the top 15, 13 are relevant. They're exactly what we're looking for. And if you can see, you'll see that they're actually different models of centrifuges um, because different manufacturers have different models. And this is quite impressive. The table uh, on the left, again, gives you precision by the categories of the nuclear fuel cycle, by the data that we searched. Um, what you see in the middle is average precision for zero shot, meaning we did not train the system at all on subject specific data. So we trained it on generic, on cats and airplanes, and then we gave it a search term, centrifuges, centrifuge cascades, and we said, give us images. And so this is the precision uh, that we got. And then the last column is average precision, few shot learning. In this case, we trained, we fine-tuned the system on very few images. By very few, I mean we trained it on average of 12 images for each category. And it is a 40-fold 40 a 40 increase in performance. So obviously this is fairly intuitive. The more subject-specific data that you have, the better the performance of your system. But the fact that we only used 12 is encouraging considering that it's going to be very hard to find a lot of uh, subject-specific data in the nuclear fuel cycle um, discipline. Um, another example is image to video. Uh, so we gave the system a seed uh, image of cooling towers of a power reactor, and the top three results um, are clearly, clearly relevant. They are of cooling towers of power reactors. Um, our videos, we, our system here is searching among about 145 videos of nuclear related uh, content. It's about 45 hours um, and is doing a frame by frame uh, searching. And then here's an example of a text to video retrieval. So our text seed was find us videos or find us frames of videos of people talking in a control room. So our top two results are clearly relevant. Um, all of these videos were, for training purposes, were annotated. So the ground truth is there in green. The, the caption that was actually given to those frames is workers in control room and host in control room. So clearly uh, this, is, this is very relevant to what we're, to what we're doing. So by way of summing up, let me give you uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a short um, where, where are we going with this. Um, this, is, this is largely from, from my perspective, from the analyst perspective. Um, we need to clearly expand the data sources that are available to us. We used uh, for our um, text uh, work. We use scientific and technical literature from one database. It would be great to expand it to look at other things that non-proliferation analysts find relevant uh, in the open source text domain. So for example, um, patents, uh, 
uh, tenders of construction, things like that. So we need to expand our data sources. We need to also clearly expand our modalities. We need to maybe look beyond the text, the audio and video to other type of sensors that may be useful to a nonproliferation analyst. We need to continue developing video-specific deep neural nets. This is an area that is changing very, very rapidly and it is advancing. We're, we're moving, we have moved beyond uh, processing videos by looking at frames. Um, so that is something that we need to incorporate into this research. Um, the results that I have shown you were either unimodal, so image to image, video to video, or bimodal, image to video, text to video, and so on. Uh, we need to now move into truly multimodal retrieval. So given a, an image, we want to see all text documents and videos. Um, as I mentioned before, we weren't able to cover the whole nuclear fuel cycle and every step and sub-step and sub-sub-step with all three modalities. So we need to grow our curated data set in depth and in breadth. And from the analyst point of view, of course, we want to have a usable system. So we want to have an analytic uh, interface um, that allows us uh, feedback between, uh, between the system and the analyst. Um, even though we have a long way to go, what is clear to me as an analyst uh, is that this is a really promising um, area of, of research. Analysts tend to, and I had this fear personally in the beginning, that we are going to be replaced, right? There are going to be machines and algorithms who collect information as well as I do and process it, it as well as I do, but faster and perhaps better, and so I'm going to be replaced. I, uh, I, don't, I don't think that is the case. I think I will have my job for a while. But it's clear that the system is, has the potential to do things that the analysts cannot do this now. I simply cannot browse through 6,000 new videos every single day. I need a way for, um, I need a way to prioritize something for my attention. And our research here demonstrated that it is in fact possible to get at data that I previously didn't have access to um, and retrieve data using visual elements um, and to do this in a, in a way that's, that's much faster than before. So as an analyst with this system, I would have access to more data and it would be prioritized for my attention, which is, um, which is really impressive. Um, so with that, let me end here and take any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you, Yana, for such a fascinating talk. Um, I'm so impressed with the way you were able to put together all of these tools. And I think, like you say, it's a very good example of um, the complementarity between humans and machines and to be able to come to a more effective result. I'm just curious, why do people put videos <laughs> like that up and so many, and like the photo, photo documentation, where, where are they coming from and what purpose do they serve from the person who's posting them? So it's a combination. Um, there, there are amateur videos of people walking around taking pictures. So they'll go to, let's say, uh, uh, nuclear tourist sites, Chernobyl, and they'll, they'll take pictures of the inside of the facility. A lot of these are promotional videos from the, from the um, operators and manufacturers of uh, those um, facilities or equipment for public relations point of view. Um, Livermore, so Lawrence Livermore does that for some of its facilities to kind of, we, we're part of a community, so everyone's welcome to see what we have. Um, and it's also news, uh, news media, so media organizations that are doing interviews in facilities. Uh, a very interesting video that I can think of um, to kind of demonstrate the non-proliferation analyst uh, value of it is uh, when, if, if you remember, um, President Ahmadinejad of Iran um, really wanted to showcase to the world where they are with their enrichment program. So they invited Western media, Iranian media, into their enrichment facility, and they and they let them videotape all of that. And so there are different perspectives, there are different um, objectives for why uh, why they create these videos. 
we don't question that. We welcome that as, as analysts. It's out there, and it's, um, it behooves us to look at it because it does have data and uh, relevant data, and you don't want to leave it on the table. Thank you for an excellent talk. So I know you said that you're not a machine learning expert, but I did have a question about, um, so the few shot learning approach, you mentioned that you take a base model from a, a non-specific data set and then you fine tune. Can you speak to that fine tuning process? So it's, it's, a, so it's essentially training it, right? And by training we mean we give the model some data and in the unsupervised model it just learns on the data itself without labels. With fine tuning it we're giving it specific subject specific data which has been labeled by a subject matter expert so it's very accurately labeled and we're letting the system get a little bit better at learning this particular subject area. That's <coughs> probably as detailed as I can I can go into as a, as a non-specialist. Um, I just have a comment on, on promotional uh, uh, media. Um, when I wanted to learn how U.S. nuclear bombs are made in detail, I just uh, went to all the public information that they use to recruit engineers because they have to brag about what they do in order to get the top engineers. And they give away all the secrets to anyone who really understands nuclear engineering. That's right. Well, thank you. Uh, I'll just say if there are any questions and on specific machine learning um, uh, research, there are a couple of publications that we have put out in open sources. So for those of you who are interested, I'm sure there's a way to get to me through uh, Citrus. So you're welcome to reach out and I'm, I'll be happy to answer those questions. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.